you've got your Bibles, would you turn to 1 John chapter 3, where the last sermon in the series, The Love of God Changes People. Today we're going to talk about uh, God's love makes the right kind of change in us. 1 John chapter 3, just three verses. By this we know that we know love that He laid down His life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. The love of God it does change people. Without God's love, we'd be lost. If God were just angry, we'd be lost. If God were just justice, we'd be lost. If God were just holy, we'd be lost. But John says in 1 John that God is love. But He's not love to the exclusion of His holiness. He's not just love. He's a holy kind of love, and He's a just kind of love. And we need to understand who He is and what He expects from us. Let's take some time, your first fill in the blank, to review where we've been in this series, because we've covered a lot of ground, and it's important to remember what He has for us in His Word and where we've been. The very first thing we we talked about was that we need to be amazed by God. I believe that one of the the, uh, epidemic problems in the church today is that we are under amazed by God. We we don't tend to see God as amazing. He doesn't take our breath away. He doesn't cause us to gasp the way He ought to. And it's not His fault. It's that we haven't really sought to know Him. We need to be amazed by God. The key verse of Psalm 8, actually repeated at the beginning and the end, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is Your name in all the earth! Are you amazed by God? Have you taken time to study God's Word? Have you taken time to observe Him in creation? Have you taken time to watch Him work in your life and in the lives of those around us? We ought to be amazed by God. He should take our breath away. The second thing we learned was that God loves sinners. We talked about God's wonderful love for sinners. I mean, here's this holy being who can't look on sin, and yet, he loves sinners. We saw that in Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. The key verse out of those verses was, but God shows his love for us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What sets true Christianity apart from any other religion is the fact that every other religion you have to keep on doing, doing, doing to try and earn the favor of some deity. But in true Christianity, it's done. And on the cross, Jesus Christ said, it's finished. Salvation was brought to man because man could not earn salvation. God loves sinners. Well, then we follow that by talking about our love for God. We looked at 1 John chapter 4, verses 16 and 19, 16 through 19. And the key verse in those verses is, so we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. His nature, the, if there's one thing that really drives everything that God is, it is his love. He, he is holy, but he is a loving, holy God. He is a just God, but he is a loving, just God. 
He's a righteous God. And all the attributes, they are impermeated with his love. We followed that by saying we can be religious, but not right with God. Too many people have religion, and yet they're not right with God. They can talk a good game, but they're not right with God. They can talk about God. They can talk about theology. They can talk about their religion, but they're not right with God. The key verse out of Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 to 40, was Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 and 39, which form one thought. And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. And a second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. We know that we love God when we love him with all of our being. When he has absolute control of everything that we are and everything that we believe, everything that we do, everything that we say, when it's all meant to bring glory and honor to him, then we know we're loving God right. And yet there's still a missing element. We need to be loving others. When we really are in love with God, it flows out in a love for others. A selfish love, a love that refuses to be involved in the lives of other people is not a love for God. It's a love for self. So we can be religious. Doesn't mean we're right with God. Then we talked about loving others is risky. Let's just face it. When you extend yourself to someone, you take a risk. You take a risk. And there are people who refuse to take risks. Jesus went over to the gatherings in this, text, sex, this section, uh, Luke 8, 26-39, and he met a man named Legion who was full of demons. And we find the key verse in verse 35 of that text. Then people went out to see what had happened. And they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone sitting in the feet sitting at the feet of Jesus clothed and in his right mind and they were afraid. This man whom we will forever know as Legion was a free man freed from the legion of demons sitting unchained uncontrolled by the demonic forces, sitting at the feet of Jesus Christ, clothed and in his right mind. When we take a risk to love others, we actually enjoy bringing them to the feet of Jesus Christ who forever changes them. But loving others can create conflicts. Sometimes people don't interpret your love right. Sometimes People are judgmental. Luke chapter 7, verses 39 to 50, we find that there was a woman who had a bad reputation and a Samaritan who thought better of himself than he ought to. And the woman comes into the house and she just worships the Lord. She pours oil on the feet of Jesus She weeps at his feet and dries his feet with her hair. And Simon the Pharisee condemns her. In fact, he condemns Jesus and said, if this man knew who this woman was, he wouldn't let her touch him. And yet in verse 47, we find the key verse. Jesus tells Simon, therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much but he is who is forgiven little loves little when we understand the depth of God's forgiveness in our lives it will be displayed to others in a in an overwhelming desire an uncontrollable desire to love them to the Lord and to love the Lord 
People who lack a love for others don't understand the amount that they have been forgiven, if they have been forgiven at all. There's conflict. People won't understand your motives. We also found that loving self always leads to ruin. It always leads to ruin. Whenever we love ourselves more than we love God and more than we love others, we are on the road to destruction. This guy was blessed by God, materially blessed by God. He was a, already a rich man, and he planted this, his fields, and everything worked out just right. I mean, we might say he invested in the stock market, and once he invested, all the stock market did was rise. Higher than it's ever been. Seven times higher than it's ever gone. He said, man, it's time to cash out. Because when I cash out on this baby, I am set for life. No worries. Eat, drink, and be merry. I got life handled. Key verses, verses 20 and 21. But God said to him, you fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. The whole purpose of material blessing is to love God more, not to love him less. To love him more to share his blessing with those in need, to give unselfishly, not to hoard. We talked about God still saves sinners. Even after all this time, God still saves sinners. Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 10. The lost sheep, the lost coin... Verse 7 is the key verse, though it's reiterated another place in the text. Verse 10. Just so I tell you, there, is, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Heaven rejoices when people repent. And yet what we find in this day and age is that the message of repentance is lacking in many services of, of church. It's not taught that you need to repent. There is no joy in continuing on in your sin, saying that you love God when you never repented of your sin. Real joy, real peace, real meaning in life comes not from saying a prayer and adding Jesus in heaven to our portfolio. Real joy, real happiness in life comes from knowing my sins are gone. And I don't ever want to repeat them again. And from this day forward, I'm keeping my eyes and mind fixed on Jesus Christ. That's where joy comes from. God still saves sinners. Then we spent a couple weeks on the, the prodigal son, or both prodigal sons. The sermon was, if you've made a mess of your life, come on home. The reality is that we've all messed up our lives. God doesn't save people who haven't messed up their lives. He saved people who've made such a mess of their life that got nowhere else to turn. You might be thinking, I've messed my life so, up so much, God can't even fix it. That's not true. God can do things in your life you never dreamed possible if you just surrender to Him. The key verse is verse 20, talking about the father. The prodigal arose and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. The father represents Jesus Christ, and no matter how far you think you've gone from the Lord, no matter how messed up you think your life has been, when God draws you to Himself, He also approaches you. Jesus Christ runs after lost people. 
He runs after lost people. He, he doesn't blast you for all the things you've done wrong. What he does is he forgives you for all the things you've done wrong. He restores you to a right relationship. What a great message. You may have done a, a wonderful job of messing your life up. God will do an even greater job of giving you new meaning to life. Restoring you to a place where you're usable again where you have meaning and hope. That's where we've been. Long ways. I want to conclude it just with these three verses. 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. God has given every believer a model of love. If you don't know how to love... If you don't know what love looks like, verses 13 to 18, or 16 to 18 tell you how love, what love should look like. Verse 16, the first half of it says, By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. He laid down his life for us. Jesus laid down his life for us. Jesus laid down his life for us. John 10, verses 17 and 18. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. What a, what a great message. It wasn't something Jesus dreaded doing. He laid it down willingly for you and me. Jesus Christ died on purpose of his own free will, of his own intentional dying for you and me. And it's interesting that that verse starts by saying, this is the reason the Father loves me. I and mean, we could sum it up this way. The reason the Father loves the Son from, on a human level, Father loves Jesus, the human being, is that Jesus died to himself. He died to his desires. He leaves us the model of love. Real love is not about pleasing self. Real love is not about, not about pleasing the flesh. Real love is about self-denial. Real love is about giving up your desires for the good of other people. Real love is about not doing what you want to do and totally surrendering what, to what the Father wants you to do. That's real love. Being a loving man or woman means thinking about others before you think about yourself. It's, in, it's a part of our inherent and inherited sinful nature that we want only what pleases us. That is why we've been redeemed. Because that is absolutely the wrong thing. God wants us to love Him and to love others. And He wants us to love them with such a deep love that we absolutely forget that we ever, we ever wanted anything. We love God with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength. There's no room in there for me. And we not love others like we love ourselves, meaning we're the, like we have that love for God. And we're just going to pour our love out on others around us, sharing the gospel with them, being a, a blessing in their lives. We are to live sacrificially toward others. That's our calling. We are to live sacrificially toward others. First John chapter 3, verse 16. Second half of that verse, we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Willful death to self. Purposeful death to self. Self-denial where the last thing I want on earth is to be pleased. 
the first thing I want on earth is to please God and others. That's a total paradigm shift in our thinking because we are so inherently selfish. The natural man wants to please himself. That's what we want. But what we need is to love God. And what others need from us is that our love for God flow out to a love for them. The word lay down, it's just one word. Tethemi, and it means to remove or take off clothing. When we lay down our life, we literally take off our life and lay it aside and we put on the life of Christ in us so that we effectively minister to others. One commentary said this, when the honor of God's name, the advancement of his church, and the need of his people demand that we love our brothers, we ought to show our love at all cost, even to the point of risking and losing our lives. That's what real love looks like. Real love is about, not about my desires. Real love is about me being a blessing to others. Jesus was teaching his disciples one day, and he kept teaching this over and over and over. In Mark chapter 9, verse 35, he sat down and called the twelve. And he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be what? Last. And servant of how many people? All. There's no room there for self. We're to live so sacrificially that we become the slaves of God and others. The mantra of Americans is, I have my rights. I have my rights. We don't have any rights as Christians. And every right that we might have is derived from God's holiness. And therefore, the only right that we truly have is the right to please Him. So we have to to put on this new thinking. We have to change the way that we think so that we stop first thinking about self. And we start first thinking about, what would God want from me in this situation? How should I respond to this situation so that God is honored and others are blessed? Even if you're in a a horrific situation, how can you respond when all of life seems against you and yet you're called to live sacrificially? You do it by only thinking about what ministers good for the grace of God in the lives of others. If someone slaps you on the right side, what are you supposed to do? Turn the left. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. The Christian life is totally anti-intuitive. It's counterintuitive. It goes against what the natural man thinks. And it's a spiritual mind that purposely thinks sacrificially. What if it kills me? I don't want to say hooray, but we get to go with be with Jesus. Right? We get to be with Jesus if you're born again. If it kills you and you're not born again, you should have thought about that sooner. And, and done business with it right? Because there's only one life that you can live, and there's only one opportunity that's called this life to get right with God. It's, it's appointed on a man wants to die after that, the judgment. And once we do die, there's no second chance. Purgatory's a lie. Reincarnation's a lie. It's appointed unto man wants to die, and following that is judgment. There's no no redos. There's no second opportunity. We have to make sure that we're right with God in this life. So we have to be the servant 
of all. So God's given us a standard for love. He's given us a model for love. He's now he's given us the standard for love. Now here's the standard. We'll, we'll go through this. It's, you've heard it before. It's not new news. It's kind of a recap of everywhere we've been. Material possessions are never to be hoarded. Never. Never to be hoarded. All the material possessions we have are to be held open-handedly so that they're at God's disposal anytime He wants them. Everything. In verse 17 of chapter 3, the first part, John says, but if anyone has the world's good. Who has the world's goods? Everyone who's alive. The only way that you wouldn't have the world's goods is if you're absolutely and completely destitute, living naked. Otherwise, you have the world's goods. We, we say things like this. We would give that person the shirt off our... So if you've got a shirt and someone needs one, you still have the world's goods. Everything we have it should be at God's disposal. He can use it however He wishes, and He will bring those opportunities to us. If we're hoarding, then we're sinning. Now, where's the line between being responsible and hoarding? That's where you have to really pray and seek God's face. How much do you need to live a life of obedience to God? That's the question each of us have to answer on an individual basis. The Bible doesn't give us a dollar amount. The Bible doesn't tell us how big or how small our house should be. The Bible doesn't tell us what kind of a car to drive, what our savings account or retirement plan should look like. All the Bible tells us is it all belongs to God. It's at His disposal. Luke chapter 12, verse 15. Jesus was talking and He said, Take care. And be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Whether you've got a lot or whether you've got a little, it doesn't ultimately define who you are. What defines who you are is what is your relationship with Jesus Christ. Are you in Christ or are you not in Christ? There's only two. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. You either are a have or a have not. And, and if you are a have, you don't need all the material possessions. If you're a have not, the material possessions are all you get until you bow the knee to Jesus Christ. So material possessions, never to be hoarded. Material possessions are God's tool for revealing the heart. God chose a wonderful way to reveal what what we worship, the issues and idols of our heart. The middle part of verse 17, John says, this person who has possessions and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him. Meaning, if there's a real need, you have the means to meet that need, and you turn, you have a hard heart. And your love of possessions has just been revealed over love of man. We have to make sure that we hold everything with open hands. That it's God's to us. It's just on loan and we are responsible to use it in ways that He allows us to use it. Matthew chapter 19, verses 21 and 22. Jesus said to him, If you would be perfect, go. Go. Sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. But what do you mean, give it all up to the poor? What do you mean, sell it and distribute it to the poor? Are you kidding me? That's not logical. 
Christian life is counterintuitive. It goes against logic. And yet, God empowers us to live that way. He empowers us to live by His grace. He, he is the provider. He is the sustainer. And if He has blessed us, He doesn't expect us to hoard it. He expects us to use it or at least have it available to be used. The third one is man's possessions reveal a, man's person, a person's relationship with God. Last part, part of verse 17, uh, John says, how does God's love abide in him? How, how is it? If he closes his heart, how can he say God's love is in him? Because God's love flows through to people. It's just a natural funnel to people. If there's no love to people, there's no love from God. God's people love people. That's, that's the message of Scripture. God's people love people because they first love God. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. And there's nothing wrong with being rich as long as you hold your riches in open palms. There is something wrong with pursuing riches. So what's the line between being a responsible Christian who makes the money to give to others and having money and making money a God? That's between you and the Lord. And believe me, the Lord will test you in that. He will bring people into your life who have needs, giving you opportunities to give. What you do with those opportunities reveals your priorities in life. God's faithful. He will test us. Material possessions reveal a person's heart and relationship with God. So last, God wants all believers to be moved into action. He doesn't want couch potato Christians. God wants people ready to move, equipped, eager to move. John 3, 1 John 3, 17 and 18, little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. We could say it this way, or this way talk is cheap in the short run, very costly in the long run. If all you're doing is talking, that's easy. We, we might say in our vernacular, put your money where your mouth is. Don't talk about it. Do it. Let's see it. Evidence it. Imagine you've got a sick child. You take the child to the doctor. He or she needs antibiotics. Okay, we're going to give you antibiotics. You give the antibiotics. Take them for 7 to 10 days. So the child takes takes the, the antibiotics for seven to ten days, and you declare the child healthy. Because they've taken the antibiotics for seven to ten days. But there's no evidence of healthiness. All your declaration of good health means nothing because the inactivity of the child says something different. All of our declaration of being healthy means nothing if actions don't accompany it. We're still sick on the couch until we put it into action. And God wants us to put our Christian life into action. And the only way we put it into action that really has eternal value is in ministering to others. I mean, I love singing songs. I love worshiping the Lord corporately. I enjoy my personal time reading the scriptures. But that does not make me Christian. What makes me Christian is when it flows out of me to others around me. Couch potato Christians are in danger because they may not be Christian at all. They may just have a really good theology, but good theology without activity is just hypocrisy. God wants us to put it into action loving others and ministering to them and being the light of Christ to them. 
Matthew chapter 12. Verses 36 and 37 ought to shake us up a little bit. Jesus said, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. I thought it was our living. Jesus is saying, look, words alone don't mean you're Christian. If you say you're Christian, it ought to flow out of you. If you say you're a believer in Christ, it ought to flow out of you. It changed life and, and a ministry to others and a love for God. It ought to change you in your inner being so that you no longer respond to life like the old person. You respond to life in a new and living way. There's going to be a judgment on our words. So let's make sure that our words and our life match. Make sure your actions tell the story of Jesus to others. There's an old statement that says, people don't care how much they know, how much you know, until they know how much you care. People are not impressed with your knowledge. They're impressed with your actions. Especially when you're ministering to them. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. The, the, the person who says, Lord, Lord, doesn't automatically get a pass. It's got to translate into a changed life. If a person prays the prayer of salvation and never changes, there's no salvation. Repentance without salvation is not salvation. For salvation to truly be salvation, repentance has to accompany that salvation so that it produces good works in the life of the person. So, we've come all this way. And we need to understand that, two, that good works do two things. The purpose of good works, and, and we understand that the given is that they should bring glory to God. But they should do two primary things. First of all, good works align us as Christians with the eternal will of God. When we're out there ministering to people, we're aligning our lives with the will of God. So often I hear, I just want to know what the will of God is. Well, obviously you're not reading the text then. Because the Holy Scriptures tell us what the will of God is. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love others like yourself. And all this, Jesus said, hangs the law and the prophets. So if you want to know the will of God, love Him wholeheartedly and love others. That's the will of God. And when we're doing good works, we're not earning salvation. We're showing that we have salvation because it's flowing out of us to others. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But, Ephesians 2.10 says, we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I see, God didn't, God's not looking down on the earth going, let's see, can I find Pat some good works today? Um, there's one. Oh, let's see, he's, he's running, he's almost got that one done. Oh, there's one over there. He doesn't do that. The good works that I am to do were eternally assigned to me. Eternally. Because if I was chosen in Him, Ephesians chapter 1, before the foundation of the world, and Ephesians chapter 2, that I should do good works, because that was what I was created to do, then these good works accompanied my salvation. And God had all of them assigned to me throughout my life. It's my job to identify them. And sometimes I don't, so he really sends them my way. You know, when the Jehovah's Witness or the Mormon knock on the door, uh, many Christians run and hide. I engage them. I don't invite them in because scriptures are clear. I go out on the porch and I engage them. Yeah, but you know the scriptures more. Well, get busy. Study. Know the word. 
research the cults, get ready for them to come, because they make kind of an annual circuit. Have you noticed that? They come to your neighborhood about annually or maybe twice uh, every two years, they'll, they'll, but they're coming. They'll be there. Prepare. You got, if they were just there and you missed them, you got a year or two to study. Okay? Get busy. Make it your homework, because this is a divine appointment coming knocking on your door. This lost person, man or woman, or two of them generally, they need Jesus. You are the word to them as you minister the word to them. That's a divine appointment. That's God saying, hey you, thickhead, here they are. I'm sending them to you. That's what he does to me. Knocking on the door, I look out and I go, oh man, here they are, the Jehovah's Witnesses. I go, my, my, my wife goes to the other room. I go outside and engage them. I, I just... Even in wintertime, I'll, I'll say, hang on, I'm going to get a coat on, I'll be out on the porch with you. And I engage them. Until either we've hit a roadblock, they convert, or one of us gets too cold. But I will engage them as long as they stand there, or as long as I can take it. But we need to do that. We need to engage them, because that's a divine appointment. Second, the purpose of good works is to shine the light of the gospel on lost people. I mean, that's, that's it. We align ourselves with the will of God. We shine the light of, of the gospel on lost people. And so Matthew chapter 5, if you'll turn there. Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. You've heard it before, but notice how it concludes. Matthew 5, beginning at verse 13, You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall, it sa- how shall its saltiness be restored? Obvious answer is it can't. It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house in the same way. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Another another text says, uh, another gospel says, so they may glorify God on the day that he visits them or on the day of judgment. Uh, When you let good works shine... You remove excuse from people who who reject Jesus Christ. When we don't do good work, we give people excuses not to receive the Lord. And we need to make sure we remove every excuse from people. They need the Lord, and we need to give it to them. So application. For the whole series, and for today, three things, four things. First of all, Have my possessions become more important than my ministry to others? If so, how? How has that happened? Second, how do my material possessions reflect my heart? If God has blessed me materially, what does that say about my heart? What what am I doing to reveal my heart? Third, and you can answer these at home. When I stand before the Lord on Judgment Day, will He tell me I've done a good job with His material gift to me? Will I hear from Him, well done, good and faithful servant? Or will I be like the last guy, you wicked and lazy servant? I don't want to hear that, thank you. I want to hear well done. And last, what changes do I need to make to become more of a responsible steward for God. What changes do I need to make? You can answer those yourselves. I think it's important that we examine our lives because if the love of God changes people, and we believe that it does, then how am I in the process of change? And how is Christ glorified by the changes in me? Well, let's pray. Then we have a, a wonderful opportunity to do a baby dedication this morning. Thank you, Father, for the love of Jesus Christ. I thank you that 
you're working in and through your word in our lives. We thank you, Lord, that in Christ, life has purpose. Outside of Christ, the only purpose we have is to please ourselves. So, Father, where we have acted like the old person or where we're not yet born again and we can't act like Christ, I pray you work in our hearts, convict us of our sin. Bring us to that place where we understand that um, a surrendered life is a blessed life. An obedient life is a blessed life. And may Christ be glorified as we seek to honor him this day. In Jesus' name, amen.